So I'm very pleased uh, to be introducing Ellen. As a matter of fact, I met Ellen for the first time at the, um, the bookstore where we all virtually are. And uh, I sort of knew when I met her that this was gonna be somebody I'd fall in love with sooner or later. And, uh, and, and, I, and I have, and I've fallen in love with her poetry as well. And I have found that the two are very closely related and they're kind of the same thing. She's a true poet. And what she does is she lets you in and you're suddenly feeling as she feels. Not because she tells you that feeling precisely, but because first of all, she deftly places you in the scene, the occasion of the poem. And secondly, because she, Ellen the poet, has been so keenly present, so open to feeling, so in the moment of what will become the poem that you'll find yourself in that moment too. And then you are hearing an extraordinary human being speaking from her deepest self, which speech I believe stands for exactly what a true poet does. And because of this, something stirs in you. And because you love true poetry, not only as a means of communication, but as a transcendent experience, and because you yourself are open, and you now are in the moment of the poem, you realize that someone is accessing your deepest self in a way that even your most ardent lover does not, unless he or she writes you a poem. But this, I believe, is what true poetry is. It doesn't happen all the time, although reading Ellen's poems, I tend to think for her that it does. Tonight, you will be touched in your deepest self, and the magic is not that Ellen accesses some sublime plane out among the ether, but she finds love, grief, commitment, in the simple quotidian scenes that she and her subjects inhabit. A kitchen, a walking path, a backyard, an automobile, a doctor's office. Pure presence, a rare soul, sturdy, robust, singing her songs of the self and everything and everyone she loves. So here we go. Ellen Bass, she contains multitudes and during this reading, so will you. Thank you, Frank. Thank you so much. Not just for that gorgeous introduction, but for helping me bring these poems into being. Frank was by my side virtually through the writing of this book and his insight and support and a brilliant mind really made it possible for these poems to get born. And uh, many, many a middle of the night, uh, insomniac, Ambien, email, and uh, many of these titles came from Frank. When I try and title a poem now, I say to myself, what would Frank title it? And I'm just so grateful to you. Thank you. Frank's um, own poetry, if you're not familiar with it, you are in for an amazing experience. Uh, there, you could start with any of his books, but I think I'd, I'd recommend starting with Late Rapturous. Welcome all of you, I'm so happy you're here. Of course, we'd love to be in person, but this is pretty darn wonderful. And many of you, are from my hometown here in Santa Cruz, but some of you are from all around the world and you wouldn't be able to be here if we weren't virtual. So I'm, this is a real silver lining. And what I have learned more than I ever knew it before is just how robust and sturdy poetry is. It's like a weed. It just will grow anywhere that you give it a chance. So. I'm so happy that you have this. I'd like to dedicate this reading to my first mentor, Florence Howe. And she opened up the world of poetry for me. And I want to begin reading the epigraph to my new book. I'll, I'll show it to you because it's 
it's so gorgeous. I think it should win a beauty prize for books. This is from Robert Penn Warren. He says, tell me a story. In this century and moment of mania, tell me a story. Make it a story of great distances and starlight. The name of the story will be time, but you must not pronounce its name. I'm going to begin with the first poem in the book. It's called Sushef. I am fortunate to have a wife and a son who are terrific cooks. I am a terrible cook, but I am a wonderful sous chef. Sous chef. I like cutting the cucumber, the knife slicing the darkness into almost transparent moons, each with its own thin rim of night. I like smashing the garlic with a flat of steel and peeling the sticky papery skin from the clove. Tell me what to do, I'm free of will. I carve the lamb into one inch cubes. I don't use a ruler, but I'd be happy to. Give me a tomato bright as a parrot. Give me peaches like burning clouds. I'll pair those globes until dawn. The syrup will linger on my fingers like your scent. Let me escape my own insistence. I am the bee feeding the queen. Show me how you want the tart glazed. I still have opinions, but I don't believe in them. Let me fillet the supple bones from the fish. Let me pit the cherries, husk the corn. You say how much cinnamon to spice the stew. I've made bad decisions. So I'm grateful for this yoke lowered onto my shoulders, potatoes mounded before me. With all that's destroyed, look how the world still yields a golden pear. Freckled and floral, a shimmering marvel. It rests in my palm so heavily, perfectly. Somewhere there is hunger, somewhere fear. But here, the chopping block is solid, my blade sharp. You can't make that wonderful poetry O oh, sound or clap here, but I know you're with me, so I, I feel you. This next poem is called The Small Country, and it began with a fascination for words that are not easy to translate into other languages, and then it took off from there. The Small Country. Unique, I think, is the Scottish tartle, that hesitation when introducing someone whose name you've forgotten. And what could capture Cafune, the Brazilian Portuguese way to say running your fingers tenderly through someone's hair? Is there a term in any tongue for choosing to be happy? And where is speech for the block of ice we pack in the sawdust of our hearts. What appellation approaches the smell of apricots thickening the air when you boil jam in early summer? What words reach the way I touched you last night as though I had never known a woman, an explorer wholly curious to discover each particular fold and hollow without guide not even the mirror of my own body. Last night, you told me you like my eyebrows. You said you never really noticed them before. What is the word that fuses this freshness with the pity of having missed it? And how even touch itself cannot mean the same to both of us, even in this small country of our bed, even in this language, with only two native speakers. My wife and I have been together for 38 years. We always joke that the first 20 were the hardest, and if you can get through them, you've got it made. Not entirely a joke in our 
experience. But um, one of the things that I found is that about, I would say about 15 years in, I realized that all of the irritations and annoyances had the potential to be fodder for poetry. And so my first response when something got under my skin would be to think, hmm, how can I make use of this? So many a poem has resulted from that. And uh, this is one of them, taking off the front of the house. I'm at the kitchen table, drinking strong tea, eating eggs with poppy gold yolks from our chickens, Marilyn and Estelle. There's a red car parked across the street and my neighbor's gorgeous irises, their frilled tongues tasting the air. Monsanto is suing Vermont, I say, turning the pages of the times. I say it loud because Janet's in the living room in the faded chair the cat has scratched into hay, eating yogurt and the strawberries she brought home from the field, where she labors to relieve the tenderberry of its heavy chemical load. What, she says, she isn't wearing her hearing aids. So I take a breath and project my voice. And as I enunciate the corporate evils, suddenly the front of the house is sheared away. We're on a stage, the audience seated on the asphalt of Young Love Avenue, watching this quirky couple eat their breakfast and yell back and forth from one room to another. And throughout the day, as I throw a load of laundry in the dryer, answer the phone, as she lies on the couch reading Great Expectations, and we bicker about the knocking in the pipes and whether we really need to call a plumber, I admire how the actor who plays the character of me and the actor who plays the character of her perform our parts so perfectly in this production that will last just a little while before it closes for good. And when night comes, we smoke a little weed, something called thunderfuck, which must be someone's high opinion of himself, but in truth is quite nice, though we only take a couple tokes since Janet's on blood pressure medication and she can't do the way she did at 20 when she slung a goatskin bag over her shoulder and wandered around Senegal in flip-flops. As I reach for her, she says, now the audience can sit on the back deck by the barbecue, and this play can be called The Old Lesbians Go to Bed at the End of the Day. I light the candle her mother gave me for my last birthday when she could still put on lipstick. The set is authentic, a messy stack of books on my nightstand. On her side, the hearing aids that sit there all day. And as she turns toward me, and I feel again, the marvelous architecture of her hips. The moon, that expert in lighting, rises over the roof line, flooding us in her flawless silvery wash. My mother died about 15 years ago, and I'm sure that you all experienced, those of you who have experienced a death of someone close to you, know that someone dies, but that they still continue to live within you. And this is called black coffee. I didn't know that when my mother died, her grave would be dug in my body. And when I weaken, she is here dressing behind the closet door, hooking up her long line cotton bra, then sliding the cups around to the front, leaning over and harnessing each heavy breast, setting the straps in the grooves on her shoulders, reins for the journey. She's slicking her lips with fire and ice. She's shoveling the car out of the snow. How many pints of four roses did she slide into exactly sized brown bags? How many cases of Pap's blue ribbon did she sling onto the counter? All the crumpled bills steeped in the smells of the lives who'd handled them, 
their sweat, onions and grease, lumber and bleach. She opened her palm and smoothed each one, then stacked them precisely, restoring order. And at 10, after the change fund was counted, the doors locked, she uncinched the girth, unbuckled the bridle. She cooked cream of wheat for my father, made a milkshake with Hershey's syrup for me, and poured herself a single highball placed on a yellow paper napkin. Years later, when I needed the nightly highball too, she gave me this story. She'd left my father in the hospital. This time, they didn't know if he'd live but she had to get back to the store. Halfway, she stopped at a diner and ordered coffee. She sat in the booth with her coat still on, crying silently, just the tears rolling down. And the waitress never said a word, just kept refilling her cup. The next poem I'm going to read is called Because, and I discussed this poem with Kevin Young in the New, York, New Yorker Poetry Podcast, at, along with talking about Frank Gaspar's poem, Cohogs. If you don't know the New Yorker Poetry Co Podcast, I can't say that, New Yorker Poetry Podcast, it's wonderful. You can get it, it's free on your app or online. And um, if I say so myself, I think it was a wonderful episode. Kevin Young and I both got so into talking about Frank's poem, Cohogs, that I think we could have gone on for a really long time. I invite you to check it out, listen to it. And this poem is uses a strategy that Frank used in his poem, which is called Anaphora, and it's the repetition at the beginning of a phrase or a word, because. Because the night I gave birth, my husband went blind. Hysterical, I guess you'd call it. Because there'd been too many people and then there was no one. Only this small creature, her tiny cry, no bigger than a sequin. Because I'd been pushing too many hours, even with her soft skull plates shifting, the collar of my bones too slender. When I reached down, I could feel the wet wisps of hair of this being living inside me, but her heart was weakening. The midwife told me not to push on the way to the hospital, but I pushed anyway. This was California in the 70s, and I'd have pushed until I died. The doctor asked for permission to cut her perineum, so polite, as though he were requesting the pleasure of the next dance. Then he slid in forceps, skillfully, not a scratch on her temples. But we left that haven the same night because my husband didn't believe in hospitals. The baby naked, wrapped only in a blanket because we both believed in skin to skin. Because the baby cried, but wouldn't suck. Because when I started to stand, I started to faint. So I had to crawl to the sterile diapers and pale yellow sleeper folded inside the brown paper bag I'd baked in the oven. Because I'm still there on my hands and knees, deflated belly and ripe breasts, huge dark nipples, tearing open the stapled bag fumbling the ducky pins. Two fingers slipped between the baby's belly and the thick layers of cotton, the sharp point. The baby, a stranger, yet so strangely familiar. Flecks of blood still stuck to her scalp. Because my husband slept beside me and I let him sleep because it would be years before I left him. Now love and grief would be greater than I ever imagined, rooted together like north and south, over and under, 
because I too had been pushed out into another world. I lay there with the baby whimpering in my arms, both of us wide awake in the darkness. This next poem is an ode to my dear dog, our dear family dog, Zeke who died about six years ago. Some of you listening have met Zeke. He loved poets. He loved poetry, I think. He came to work with me every day. And um, he, uh, I, I wrote this poem for him right before he died. Ode to Zeke. O oh, breathing drum, O oh, cask of dark waters, O oh, decaying star, my barking heart, my breaking brother, what will seep into the space your body leaves? Oh, huge 18 muscled ears, oscillating ossicles and cochlea, your busy canals, now hollow caves of quiet. I have said your fur is black, but you are silvered, rhymed with frost. You are the new moon. You are light in the dark house. How long will I see your shadow? Oh, heavy hunk of existence. Oh, great flank I have rested my head upon when I was too weak for human touch. Sleek leading man, you debonair dog. How people on the avenue stopped to swoon. Oh, splaying legs once faster than rabbits, canines slashing flesh. Urgent thug, unstoppable thrust. Oh, happy snapping at the wind. What do you remember now that you are a mudslide, glacier melting, cliff collapsing into the sea? I have memorized your milky breath, your ballet leaps and whirly gigging, your princely patience as the children dressed you. Soccer seek in jersey and shorts, one paw on the ball, snorkel Zeke with mask and fins, bar mitzvah Zeke and a yarmulke and my father's silk talit. Oh, my text of decrepitude, my usher to death, companion of 10,000 years. I'll fry you a fish. I'll sit by your bowl, eat from my hand. I have nowhere to go. This next poem is called The Kitchen Counter. Today, I heard a young woman read a poem in which her husband lifts her bare bottom onto the kitchen counter and in the next line spreads her legs. The marriage has problems. They may already be divorced, but suddenly I am ruining the fact that no one has lifted my bottom onto a kitchen counter. Not when my bottom trotted high and proud, and not when it began to eye the floor, as if contemplating its future. And now I'm going to die without ever being taken on those cold, hard tiles. Don't tell me it's not too late. It is. And I'm, I'm pleased to say that this poem has inspired at least one younger woman to get her bottom up onto that kitchen counter. And I was glad to hear that. So if you're young enough, take my advice, don't wait too long. I'm gonna um, just do a tiny public service announcement here about book buying. I really would like to encourage you to buy books, especially from Bookshop Santa Cruz, who has been kind enough to host this. And it's not about the poet, what a poet makes unless you're Mary Oliver or Billy Collins from your poetry is not going to amount to all that much. But our independent publishers and our independent bookstores, our poetry publishers really need you to buy books, never more than now. Um, please buy mine, 
by Franks. Uh, some of you have already bought one or two of mine, but you could buy another one. It would be all right. You can give it for a gift. I really encourage you to. And if you've lost your job, if you don't have money during this time, and you really want a copy of my book, just contact me through my website, and I will be more than happy to send you one. There's a link in the chat room that Catherine has just put in there that makes it easy to, to buy books. Okay. Now we'll come back to the poems. Marriage. When you finally, after long suffering, lay the length of your body on mine, isn't it like the strata of earth? The pressure of time on sand, mud, bits of shell, the moving water, wind, ice that carries the minutes, minerals that fuse sediment into rock. How to bear the weight with every flake of bone pressed in. O oh, love, it is balm and it seals. It binds us tight as the fur of a rabbit to the rabbit. When you strip it, grasping the edge of the sliced skin, pulling the glossy membranes apart, the body is warm and limp. If you could, you'd climb inside that wet, slick skin and carry it on your back. This is not neat and white and lacy like a wedding, not the bright effervescence of champagne spilling over the throat of the bottle. This visceral, bloody union that is love, but beyond love, beyond charm and delight, the way you to yourself are past charm and delight. This is the shucked meat of love, the alleys and broken glass of love, the dizzy hoarse cry, the stubborn hunger. Goat, cow, man. After the mob murdered the man for eating a cow, it was found to be meat from a goat. Why can I not stop thinking about it? The stringy flesh inside his gut and the microbes run riot when his heart stopped. How fast they started breaking down the blood clotted muscle of his stomach, slick intestines as though they were meant to destroy the evidence of human, what can I call it? Sin, the curse of certainty, some twist in the helix that insists on splitting us apart. The cow is not the goat. I am not you. The man is a few inches of old newsprint, a knot of hair, eye sockets, but I keep picturing that kitchen, his wife and children stuttering, it's goat, it's goat, and the goat, her white coat, the little kernels of her teeth, her pale slitted eyes. This next poem I wrote because there was a project, there is a project called new voices writers responding to the holocaust that i was asked to take part in and contemporary writers and poets were uh, each assigned an image from the holocaust and asked to write in response to that image and my poem is called photograph and the title of the photograph is Jews probably arriving to the Woods Ghetto circa 1941 to 1942. Why is a horse here alongside the train? Two horses yoked with leather harnesses, light silvering their flanks in the midst of the Jews descending. Where is the driver taking the cart? loaded with wooden planks. 
What is in the satchel that weighs down the arm of a woman in a dark coat, her hair parted on one side? A woman I could mistake for my mother in the family album. Only my mother was in Philadelphia selling milk and eggs and penny candy because her mother escaped the pogroms, a small girl in steerage crying for her mother. What are the tight knots of people saying to one another? A star burns the right shoulder blade of each man, each woman. Light strikes each shorn neck and caps each skull. No one is yet stripped of all but a pail or a tin to drink from and piss in. Dread like sun sears the air and breaks over the planes of their faces. Light clatters down upon them like stones, but we can't hear it. Nor can we hear blood thud under their ribs. They will be led into the ghetto and then they will be led out to the camps. But for now, the eternal now, the light is silent, silent the shadows in the folds of their coats. The bones of the horses are almost visible. Their nostrils are deep, soft shadows. And the woman, who could be, but is not my mother, still carries her canvas bag and looking closer, what might be a small purse. This next poem was inspired by a couple of my students who were doing something that I thought was really incredibly interesting and um, engaging, which is to take a poem that's written in a language that you don't know, and to make a kind of faux translation by sound, just what you think maybe those words could possibly mean, if you thought of them as English words that were kind of one off because you can't understand what they mean. So I did that with a Finnish poem and the actual translation of the title of the Finnish poem by Oli Heikkinen is sink your fingers into the darkness of my fur. And so I peeked just at the English translation of the title, but I didn't look at the translation of the rest of the poem. And so my, my first draft was just working as much as I could from from Ole Heikkinen's poem and then I worked with it some more to actually make it make more sense. So sink your fingers into the darkness of my fur. And the wonderful, I'll just say the wonderful thing about this is that no matter what you do, you're always writing your own mind. You're always writing your own heart. So you can you can start with anything and what you have to say is going to make its way through. Sink your fingers into the darkness of my fur. Up until this sore minute, you could turn the key, pivot away. But mine is the only medicine now, wherever you go or follow. The past is so far away, but it flickers, then cleaves the night. The bones of the past splinter between our teeth. This is our life, love. Why did I think it would be anything less than too much of everything? I know you remember that cheap motel on the coast where we drank red wine. The sea flashing its gold scales as sun soaked our skin. You said, this must be what people mean when they say I could die now. Now, we're so much closer to death than we were then. Who isn't crushed, stubbed out beneath a clumsy heel? Who hasn't stood at the open window, sleepless, for the solace of the damp air? I had to get old.
to carry both buckets, yoked on my shoulders. Sweet and bitter waters I drink from. Let me know you, ox you. I want your scent in my hair. I want your jokes. Hang your kisses on all my branches, please. Sink your fingers into the darkness of my fur. I'm going to read the title poem from the book, Indigo, and then I'll close with just one more poem after that. Indigo. As I'm walking on Westcliff Drive, a man runs toward me, pushing one of those jogging strollers with shock absorbers so the baby can keep sleeping, which this baby is. I can just get a glimpse of its almost translucent eyelids. The father is young, a jungle of indigo and carnelian, tattooed from knuckle to jaw, leafy vines and blossoms, saints and symbols. Thick wooden plugs pierce his lobes, and his sunglasses testify to the radiance haloed around him. I'm so jealous, as I often am. It's a kind of obsession. I want him to have been my child's father. I want to have married a man who wanted to be in a body, who wanted to live in it so much that he marked it up like a book, underlining, highlighting, writing in the margins, I was here. Not like my dead ex-husband who was always fighting against the flesh, who sat for hours on his zafu chanting Om and then went out and broke his hand, punching the car. I imagine when this galloping man gets home, he's going to want to have sex with his wife, who slept in late, and then he'll eat barbecued ribs and let the baby teeth on a bone while he drinks a dark beer. I can't stop wishing my daughter had had a father like that. I can't stop wishing I'd had that life. Oh, I know it's a miracle to have a life any life at all. It took eight years for my parents to conceive me. First, there was the war, and then just waiting. And my mother's bones so narrow, she had to be slit and I airlifted. That anyone is born, each precarious success from sperm and egg to zygote, embryo, infant is a wonder. And here I am alive almost 70 years and nothing has killed me. Not the car I totaled running a stop sign or the spirochete that screwed into my blood. Not the tree that fell in the forest exactly where I was standing. My best friend shoving me backward so I fell on my ass as it crashed. I'm alive and I gave birth to a child. So she didn't get a father who'd sling her onto his shoulder and so much else she didn't get. I've cried most of my life over that. And now there's everything that we can't talk about. We love, but cannot take too much of each other. Yet she is the one who, when I asked her to kill me, if I no longer had my mind, we were on our way into Ross shopping for dresses. That's something she likes, and they all look adorable on her. She's the only one who didn't hesitate or refuse or waver or flinch. As we strode across the parking lot, she said, okay, but when's the cutoff? That's what I need to know. And I'll end with this poem. It's called Any Common Desolation. I wrote it in a personal time of desolation and had no idea how relevant it would be for our time now. Any common desolation can be enough to make you look up at the yellowed leaves of the apple tree, the few that survived the rains and frost shot with late afternoon sun. 
They glow a deep orange gold against a blue so sheer a single bird would rip it like silk. You may have to break your heart, but it isn't nothing to know even one moment alive. The sound of an oar in an oarlock or a ruminant animal tearing grass. The smell of grated ginger. The ruby neon of the liquor store sign. Warm socks. You remember your mother, her precision a ceremony, as she gathered the white cotton, slipped it over your toes, drew up the heel, turned the cuff. A breath can uncoil as you walk across your own muddy yard, the Big Dipper pouring night down over you, and everything you dread, all you can't bear, dissolves and like a needle slipped into your vein, that sudden rush of the world. Thank you. Thank you all so much for being here with me tonight. And if there are some questions, we won't go on too long because I know that, you know, being looking at a screen, you get a little weary. But if there are a few questions, uh, I'd be glad to spend 10 minutes or something like that, responding. And Catherine, maybe some have come in or, or maybe not. They have, we'll start with, Okay. Um, seems like some of your poems are reflective on the deep memories that have shaped you as you gracefully age. Can you share how you select those meaningful past moments as fodder for your art? Yes, I think that the truest, um, the true, the truth is that they select me. And I think that our minds are so interesting this way. I think my mind is very much like a sieve. And I know people joke about that. You know, my mind is like a sieve. And I like most people my age, my memory is really shot to hell, um, you know, in terms of trying to remember the functional things I'm trying to remember. But I think it works really well with the past because so much falls out and what remains is what somehow has a true significance for me. And sometimes these memories offer themselves up time and time again over the years and I know that they're waiting to be incorporated in a poem to help me make a poem. And sometimes it takes a long time before the poem actually comes. But the older I get, the, I, I have to use the word pleasure, the more pleasure, pleasurable it is for me to return to some of these memories. And the more my childhood in particular seems to me richer and richer with uh, this store of memories. The next question is um, about your favorite poem of your own, uh, if, if it's written from a moment of inspiration or found in diligent writing practice. Um, both. I find that inspiration comes from diligent writing practice. And the more I work at it, and the longer I work at it, the more possible it is to have that thing that can be called inspiration, or sometimes to me, it seems like mercy, like the muse seems me sees, sees me working so hard for so long that she decides to just throw me a bone. I think that the more that we work at it, the more that we study, the more skill set we develop, the more tributaries there are for the poem to take so that I'm uh, capable of what the poem wants. We're in service to the poem. I'm trying to, trying to allow the poem to be written. And so I'm trying to bring everything I have to that process and the the work 
And, and I, I'm a, a slow learner, so it's taken me a long time to develop some of the, this, this craft. And, and every new poem that I approach is scary. I don't have, I, I have never sat down with the feeling of, I've got this, ever. It's always with uh, a certain amount of just plain hope and willingness to stay with it. The next question is over what period of time were the poems in Indigo written? These poems, all but one, were written over six years. And there's one poem in here called Kiss about um, my dear friend Lynn doing mouth-to-mouth uh, -mouth, uh, artificial respiration to resuscitate a lizard. Um, so if, if that's not enough to make you want to buy the book. <laughs> but that poem I wrote many years ago and on a particularly gloomy day, I was looking through old journals and I found a, a first draft of that poem and I took it out and decided to really work on it and was, was able to bring it through. But the other poems were all over a six year period. My most the, the book before this book was published in 2014. This one's 2020. And maybe a last question. Wendy's asking about the poem Indigo. She says, we end up somewhere so vastly different from where we start, but it all fits. Could you talk about the process of writing that one? Yes. Um, this poem, the, the elements of this poem, many of the elements of this poem are are aspects of my life, of my marriage, of being a mother that I have written about for over 40 years. And almost all of those poems were essentially failed poems. But I returned to those themes because they're such important themes in my life over and over and over again, and always with failure. I, I believe that failure is an important part of the process, not the actual failing, but the attempting and being willing to fail and then attempting again. And I think all those poems were not wasted. I think they helped get me here. And then one day I was indeed walking on West Cliff Drive in Santa Cruz, where I walk almost every day when that's possible. And I saw this man and I looked at him and everything started to click into place. And I saw his body as being written on as, as I write about in Indigo. And it made me think about the, um, the process of someone tattooing their body to uh, really make themselves more present in their life to, to write on their body and say I was here. And I went home and I don't think I've ever written a poem the same way I wrote this one. I took a little scrap of paper and the through line of the poem came to me just here, 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 here in about three minutes and I knew the way that the poem was going to move. And that ne never happens for me. Uh, I really have to write the first part in order to write the second part in order to write the next part. But it was just there and I just jotted it down really quickly. And then I waited for some weeks because I was going to have some time. I, I don't do this very often, but I was gonna be at a writer's residency. And I knew that I would have the time to really work with this poem slowly and carefully so that I could find the language for what it was that I wanted to say. And I waited and I took my little scrap of paper and uh, over a period of a few days was able to pretty much just write that poem. So it was quick and it was slow simultaneously. So thank you all for being here. I appreciate it 
so much. It's been a joy for me.